Amen. Amen. How's everyone doing this morning? Woo! Always good to be in the house of the Lord. Always good to be worshiping with our church family. Uh, I do want to invite you, if you're able, if you would stand real quick uh, this morning. Um, obviously, uh, there's always every day, there's never a day that evil's not present in this world. Of course, light is present too, amen? Amen. <laughs> But there's never a day that evil's not at work. Light is at work, evil is at work, and we know from these last few days that evil has been at work again, and uh, we know there's been some tragedy in, in Buffalo and, and also in uh, Milwaukee and uh, in other various spots around the world. The enemy never ceases to try to kill, to steal, and to destroy. And so this morning, before we enter into the word of God, I want us to take a moment, and I want us to speak Jesus over these places, amen? So would you with me lift your voice this morning? There's power in prayer, amen? amen. There's power in prayer. We don't pray into thin air. We pray to the Lord God who created everything and is over everything and has authority over everything, amen? So when we pray, we are partnering with God and we are releasing the power of God over these circumstances and situation. And we're also very sensitive of the hurt and the pain that people, there are people hurting and in pain right now because of the evil that's taken place at these various spots. So can we pray with compassion as we pray with power? Let's also pray with compassion. Would you join me this morning? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you, Father, Lord, and we lift our voices, God, and Lord, we pray over these areas, we pray over these people, Lord God, that you would somehow, Lord God, bring hope to them in this moment, Father God. Love on them, cover them, Lord God, with your grace. Cover them with your mercy, Lord God. Lord, we pray that you would just blanket them, Lord God, this morning with your arms of peace, Father God. Lord, we pray, Lord Jesus, that, Lord, you would move in ways that we don't even know how to pray for for them, Father God. But, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would go and do the work that only you can do powerfully, Lord God, and that your name would be glorified in and through these circumstances, Father God. And, Lord, we continue to join our voices as we pray against the evil that's present in this world. And we pray that the light of heaven would be at work through your church, through us, Lord God, every day to illuminate the world around us with the only hope that we know, <laughs> Father God, and that's you, Lord Jesus, that you would come and rescue the hearts of people, rescue the lives of people, people who have evil in them, Lord God, because we're all born with that sinful nature. Lord God, people who have evil in them, God, we pray that that light, your light would reach them, Father God, that you would turn their lives around, that God, before they step out in any certain direction of evil, that Lord, you would rescue them, save them, Lord God. Jesus, we pray salvation, Lord God, over the lost this morning as we come before you. We pray your help and your love and your compassion over those hurting because of these tragedies. Lord, we love you and we thank you that we can pray this prayer with confidence this morning. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Praise God. We are in this study in the book of Romans. We've jumped back in a few weeks ago. We got to remember that the book of Romans is a letter. <laughs> it's a letter that was written. Uh, our whole Bible are letters. So the chapters and the verses and all of those sort of things, those are things that men uh, instituted, put into place to help break things down, just to help us in our understanding. But as we're studying a book like we're doing, all right, it's called, called expository teaching uh, or preaching, um, it's important to know that from week to week, it's, it's small movements forward. So you're going to hear consistent themes each and every week, all right? So it's not Pastor Tim, you just said that last week. I did say that last week, and I might say it again next week. We're slowly moving through a book, all right? And it's a letter that was written. And so we have to just understand that. And as we move along, the themes do progress and they change, but slightly from week to week. Are you all with me? Amen. But the whole point of it is to take us deeper in our understanding of the word of God. This morning, we're beginning a, a new chapter, Romans chapter 10. And we're going to learn this morning about the power of faith, amen? How many have experienced the power of faith in your own life, all right? We're gonna learn just a little bit more about the power of faith. Salvation comes by faith, through grace, God's grace as he's reached out to us, but by faith we lay hold of it, we grab it, we receive it, and by faith it changes our lives, amen? And we do this by confessing with our mouth, with believing in our hearts, that Jesus Christ is Lord, 
It's nothing more, it's nothing less. As we learn here in the book of Romans, Paul masterfully uh, reveals the gospel message, the good news. Last week I said it's incredible news, and today I say it's incredible truth, amen. Jesus Christ saves you and I when we put our faith, our trust, and our hope in him. And we will see this morning, along with that theme, uh, we will see that it's also the end, that Jesus Christ put an end to righteousness as it pertains to the law, okay, as it pertains to the law. So this morning, we're going to hit my two favorite verses that we preach every week, or that I pray every week, Romans 10, 9, and 10. That's a part of our text this morning, all right? Uh, when I say that it's the end of the law of righteousness, what is meaning is that the law is incapable. The law is incapable of producing righteousness within us. Amen? It's only Jesus Christ. And the whole point of the law was to show everyone, Israel and all of us, every generation after, that we are incapable of being good enough to merit God's love or favor on our own. We can only receive it by faith as we believe in the power that, that, of Christ through what he did for us on the cross. In the 17th verse of this cha chapter, we will read that faith comes by hearing the gospel message. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. And Paul encourages us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That even means that the person who pulled the trigger over the weekend, if they were to call upon the name of the Lord, guess what? They too would be saved, amen? We know that Paul himself, the great apostle who wrote this letter, he himself stood by as Christians were put to death. He gave his approval as Christians during that time period before his conversion. Uh, he was a part of putting Christians to death, putting them into prison, persecuting them. So we know that God's love knows no boundaries, amen? And that's good for all of us because we all know that apart from Christ, we have no hope. When we look in the mirror, only we and God knows what's inside of us, amen? So we're thankful for the grace of God. We're thankful for his mercy. We're gonna uh, begin by, re or we're gonna, we're gonna, whoops, we're gonna be in, we're gonna be in the book of, uh, or the, the verses of one through 13 this morning, but rather than read the whole text at one time like we've often done, we're gonna take it verse by verse, uh, and that'll save us just a little bit of time this morning. So let's kick it off with verse one. Let's read together. If you have your Bibles, hopefully you're there. Romans chapter 10. If not, you can follow along on the screen behind me. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. Here Paul uses two really key words, desire and prayer. Desire and prayer. If you have experienced the life-changing power of the Lord Jesus Christ and you yourself have been saved through the love of Christ and what he has gifted to us through his work on the cross, then there will be a new desire that arises within us, all right? It won't be a desire for the old things of our life, necessarily. Our flesh takes a while to die. Though our flesh is dead when we are in Christ, when we are new in Christ, it's still kind of like, have you ever like, uh, seen a, a bug or something, you know, you kind of accidentally stepped on it or something like that, and uh, it's dead, but it's still kind of moving. You know what I'm talking about? So the flesh is like that. It's dead when we come to Christ, but it still tries to move in those familiar directions, okay? But when you give your life to Christ, there's a new desire that rises up on the inside of us, and it's not a desire for those old things, it's a desire that we don't fully understand, but it's a desire towards the things of the Lord, towards the heart of the Lord, towards the mind of Christ. And we may not fully understand it, but all of a sudden, we begin to look at the world just a little bit differently. And that person who pulled the trigger, there's not hate in us towards them. There's compassion in us towards them. We hate what they did, amen? We hate it, it hurts us, it breaks our heart, but we understand that sin is at work in that person's life. And if that sin is removed, they too would be a new person in Christ Jesus. And so there's this desire that raises up within us when we give our lives to the Lord that has now a new compassion towards the lost and the people who do evil in the world because now we have an understanding that we didn't have before. It's sin that moves us in those horrible directions. 
but it's the grace and the power of God that brings us to a new direction in life. So as children of God, fresh in our faith, there's a new desire that begins to raise up within us, and it's a desire to see the lost come to an understanding that we now have, and that's that Jesus can change their life around like he's changed our lives around, amen? Desire, if we're in Christ, we will have this desire within us. If we die in our sinful state, we will be eternally separated from God. We will never have a chance ever again. If we die physically in our sinful state, and we know it's appointed unto man to die once, we're all gonna die a physical death unless we're blessed enough to be here when Jesus comes back and raptures the church, all right? We'll die a physical death. But if we die that physical death, apart from Christ and our spiritual life is still dead, we will remain spiritually dead for all of eternity. We will never have hope beyond this life to ever enter into the presence of God, to ever experience his grace, his mercy, or his love. So if you're here this morning or you're listening online and you've not yet given your heart to Christ and received his grace and mercy, friend, now's the day to do that, amen? Not tomorrow, because you're not promised tomorrow. Now's the day to do that. Today you can receive the grace and mercy of God. If you're hearing this message today, then there's hope for you. There's hope for your eternity if you will receive the work of Christ into your hearts and lives. But Romans 3.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And the Bible tells us that we were all born sinners. So until we meet Jesus and have a very personal encounter with him, like Paul did, that changes our life, we remain in that spiritual state of death now and for all of eternity. But if you're physically alive today, there's good news, incredible news, incredible truth for you today. That is, you can receive the gift of God through Jesus Christ, you can receive his mercy, you can receive his grace. You can receive that which you do not deserve, and you can escape that which you do deserve, and you can find new life in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? There's hope for you today. And there should be this desire in us for the world to have that same experience. We're not exclusive in our faith. In other words, we're not not walking around in pride because we now have, we're now clothed in this great salvation. No, we're walking around in humility, understanding that we are deserving of death, but have only escaped it through the love and the power of Christ. And we too understand that every other lost person in the world needs that same hope that we have. It's why Jesus could hang out with sinners, not because he approved of their sin, but because he had compassion for them and his desire was to win them over to the truth, amen. Proverbs 11.30 says, he who wins souls is wise. It should be our primary objective each and every day. No matter where you go to work, no matter where your office building is, you're only there because you've been commissioned by God to be in that location, to work that job, to have that career. Why? Because you represent Christ there, amen? He who wins souls is wise. This verse also reveals that prayer is a key necessity to the winning over of souls. I've never read of any of the great revivals that were never preceded by earnest prayer. Every revival that that has ever taken place upon this planet was birthed in prayer. People like you and I coming together praying because we understand the importance of prayer. Why do we pray? Because we're humbling ourselves before God and acknowledging, I can do nothing about this situation. Lord, we need you. Nobody else could save me, only you, and no one else can save this world, only you. So we come to prayer praying for the lost. That may be our brother, that may be our mother, but we're praying that God would do that which we're incapable of doing, awakening their mind, awakening their soul to the powerful love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Prayer and revival always go together. Prayer should be a priority for all of us. It's why we prioritize prayer here at Liberty Church. We're getting ready in June 1st to kick off the next Arise Prayer Challenge at 6 a.m. in the morning. We would love for you to be a part of that. It's 30 minutes of prayer led by myself and others in this congregation. And it's a powerful time, a powerful way to start off our day. 
Maybe you don't like to get up, uh, or may, well, hopefully we all like to get up at some time, all right? But, but, but maybe you don't like the idea of being on Zoom to pray, even though I love it. I absolutely love it. I get to see Pastor Bob in his T-shirt. Come on, everybody. I get to see baseball. I mean, it's just, it's just a lot of fun, all right? But if you wanna be in person, Monday through Saturday, over in Student Life Auditorium, it's open for prayer from six to seven, live prayer. Sometimes there's... 15 people there. Sometimes you might be the only person there. It doesn't matter because you're still with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? We have prayer on Monday nights at 7 o'clock in the Student Life Auditorium led by our prayer directors. We have prayer on Wednesday night right here in the sanctuary where I come to pray for this message each and every week, all right? Although the next few weeks because of the Kenya trip, I won't be here, just FYI, but you can still come and pray over the next few weeks on Wednesday night from six to seven. There's a lot of different ways that we can join together to prayer. Prayer and revival always go together. If there's someone in your life that you know needs to know the love of Christ and they're not yet saved, my, my first question to you today is, how have you been praying for them? Are you praying for them? How often are you praying for them? Are you saying that I have to pray a certain way in order for them to get saved? No, you might pray once and they might get saved. You might pray a thousand times for them and they might get saved. It has nothing to do with how often you pray, what you pray. It comes, or the matter of the fact is that we humble ourselves before God and we plead our case before him, believing that God will move on their behalf, amen? They also have a free will. God will never interfere with their free will. He may be moving on them and we may not even know it because they're resisting him, rejecting him, pushing away like, like Pharaoh uh, did and we read about Pharaoh a few weeks ago. So we never know what God is doing because God's not visible always to our physical eyes. But we believe by faith that when we pray, God moves. And when we pray, God changes things, amen? Our prayers are always very powerful. So we pray for the lost, we pray for the six, we pray for anything Philippians 4, 6 says, in everything, by prayer and thanksgiving, and with supplication, let your requests be made known to the Lord, to God. This is why we prioritize prayer. When we pray, we believe God hears us. When we pray, we believe, believe God sees us. When we pray, we believe God moves, amen? And when we pray, we believe that it absolutely changes everything. Paul modeled for us this great desire for the lost. And if you're a child of God, you too will have this desire for the lost. It will be there. Maybe it needs to be uncovered by a few things that are cluttering it up. But if you're a child of God, that desire to see the lost saved, it's in you. And when you spend time with Jesus, it begins to become uncluttered. And it becomes very evident that it's within you. And you begin to get this you got, you got to tell them. You got to pray for them. You got to go. You begin to see this desire build within you, all right? And Paul also modeled for us praying, desire and prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just want to take a moment right now, and I, I just lift up our church family right here at Liberty Church, those here, those listening online. I pray that you would stir up that desire within us, Lord God, to see the lost come to know your love in a powerful way, God. Stir that desire up within us, Lord God, and may it provoke us to times of prayer. Lord God, I pray for those who pray that they would find themselves praying more. For those who aren't in the pattern of praying that, God, they would find themselves getting up and joining the call or coming to the church or maybe they just get out and they kneel by their bed but Lord they begin to pray and they begin to just sense that something's taking place in their own life God stir up this desire within us for the lost and Lord I pray that it would provoke each and every one of us to times of prayer verse 2 for I bear them witness that they may have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge so like the Israelites, there are many people in the church today who are passionate about God. Many people who are passionate about God, but they have no regard for the truth or the power that comes from knowing Christ. People use their religion or they use their doctrines to make God into something that they want him to be. There are a lot of people that come to church and we're serving, we're, we're serving God in much, many different ways. 
Even here in this place, right here, there are people who understand the power of God through Jesus Christ, and there are people here who like religion. They like the structure of coming together, singing songs, and they like the goodness that it represents. I remember, uh, I remember as a dad with my kids being little, McKenna and Titus, I remember this store that was in the mall. I don't see them too much anymore, but uh, they were there when my kids were little, and uh, we've spent a few dollars there. It's called Build-A-Bear. How many, raise your hand if you're familiar with that story. Everyone loves a teddy bear, right? The cool things about this store is that you got to go into build a bear and you got to create your own bear. You got, you, got to, you, got to cre you got to pick the bear that looked the way you want it. You got to dress it the way you wanted to dress it, stuff it the way you wanted to stuff it. You could put a lot of stuffing in it and you could have a fat bear or you could put a little stuffing in it and it could be a thin bear. You could create this bear any way that you wanted to create it and then you paid for it he paid a lot for it, and then, <laughs> but you got the bear you, that your kids wanted. They got the bear that they wanted, and, and they walked out, and that's the way it is in church today. There are people who understand the power of God through Jesus Christ who are in our churches, and then there are people who come to church, and they're building their own religion. It's their own religion. It's their own way. It really doesn't fully line up with the word of God. The, the, pra, the preacher is up on the platform preaching. They even may say amen. But the truth of the matter is, is that last week we learned something really, really important as it pertained to Israel, but it also carries over to all of us. We learned in last week's message that there is laid for us in Zion a stone that causes men to stumble and to fall. That stone is a cornerstone that's being laid down to create a foundation upon which the kingdom of God is being built and it will never fall. That cornerstone of that foundation that's being laid upon which the kingdom of God is being built is Jesus Christ. And that cornerstone for some causes people to step up on it and they feel the firmness of that foundation and they enjoy the security that comes from it. And there are other people who can't see it and they come across that cornerstone and they trip and they fall over it and they do it over and they do it over and they do it over again and they can't accept that there's this beautiful, powerful, big, firm stone that's right there in front of them that if they would just open their eyes and see it, would become a major component to bringing eternal security into their lives. This is the truth. It's the good news. It's the incredible news. It's incredible truth. If you remove Jesus Christ and you try to worship God without any regards to Jesus, then you're worshiping God in vain. Your worship is in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 13 through 15 says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is worthless, and so is your faith. In that case, we are also exposed to false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. See, we believe that Jesus Christ was raised to new life and that those who put their faith in him were also raised to new life, amen? And if you take Jesus Christ out of that equation, all you have left to know about God is a religion and it's a dead religion that will not save you and it will not produce for you eternal life. The only one who can give you that key that unlocks the narrow gate that leads into eternal life is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the key. He's it. There is no other way into heaven by which man can be saved except through the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse number three in our text says, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, what, righteousness, they did not submit to God's righteousness who is Jesus Christ. I think most of us understand that God's righteousness and our righteousness, they're not compatible. <laughs> they're polar opposites. We, apart from Christ, might think we're pretty good people. We might even put ourselves up on a pedestal. We might even stand in front of the mirror and enjoy the way we look, thinking, hey, 
I'm a pretty cool cat, I'm pretty good. But that righteousness that you think you have is nothing compared to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, it's not, they're polar opposites. They're not even comparable. The only possibility of you and I having right standing with God does not come through our own righteousness, our own good work, our own religion. It comes through what God has provided for us, and that is Jesus Christ and his righteousness, the righteousness that he gives us that we don't deserve. See, I never will stand before God because of my righteousness, <laughs> but I will stand before God one day because of his righteousness. I'm righteous because he gave me righteousness. Everyone say, I am righteous. That was a true statement if you know Jesus Christ. If you know Jesus Christ. Having faith in, believing in the work of Christ on the cross and confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, this is what makes us right with God. Self-righteousness may look great on the outside and often people will even notice it. They might even notice what you're noticing in the mirror. You're a pretty cool cat. <laughs> you're, you look great and you're doing some really good things, all right? And, uh, and that's, that's pretty cool. But God knows the truth and you know the truth. And none of us can stand before God and enjoy what he has for us and even receive what he has for us if we're not clothed in the righteousness that comes only through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a gift. It's a gift. Verse four says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Paul very clearly tells us here that the, the law no longer plays a role in our righteousness or our perceived righteousness or better yet, our standing with God, <laughs> all right? So the law does not have any more place in our lives or Israel's life as it pertains to our right standing with God. Really, when we're talking about righteousness, that's really what we're talking about, our right standing with God. Apart from Christ, we cannot be in right standing with God, but in Christ, we are in right standing for God. It has nothing to do with our actions, our works, the law, no law, it has nothing to do with any of that. Matthew 5.17 says, for, I'm sorry, Matthew 5.17 says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So this is where Christ becomes extremely powerful for you and I, okay? Because the law has no rule over our lives anymore. It has no power over our lives. The, the intent of the law was to show us how much we fall short, all right? That's the intent. It was intended to change and mold and shape our hearts, but what we found or what Israel found in so trying to keep the laws, they couldn't. And that's the whole point that God was trying to show them. But the power behind Christ is that he was not only 100% man, he was also fully God. And because he was fully God, he was who he said he was, the son of God, he was able to complete the law. He was able to walk it out, live it out, speak it out, shout it out. There was never a letter, a dot, or a T of the law that Jesus Christ did not entirely fulfill. He was perfect and flawless in every way. That's what we believe the Bible teaches. That's what we believe, and that's the power behind Christ because in him, he fulfilled the law, and that's why he can clothe us with that righteousness. He was righteous, so he can give us his righteousness. It's his to give. You see what I'm saying? We can't earn it. We can't work for it, but he can give it to us. That's the power behind Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't end the law, he fulfilled the law, therefore he became very powerful for you and I when we begin to understand what he did for us and what his will for us is. So no one can earn righteousness, the law showed us that, but Jesus wants to give us his righteousness and all of us can receive it if we want to. If you're here today, if you're listening online, it's it's only the grace of God that's, that brought you to this place to hear this message. And so, if he brought you through grace to hear this message, he will also, in a like manner, give you the faith to believe. You do have to, of your own free will, take that step. And if you take that step, guess what? You will become a new person in Christ Jesus. 
Your sins will be forgiven. When you look in the mirror, you might know what you've done, but you won't feel the guilt or the shame from it anymore because Christ will remove that from you. He took care of that sin for you. He paid for our shortcoming in our sinfulness for us on the cross, amen? And in Christ, we are now 100% made righteous because of the work of Christ. Paul said in Romans chapter six that as believers, we're no longer under the control of the law. We are now under the control of grace. Romans 6.14 says, for sin, listen to this, for sin will have no dominion over you. He's talking to those who believe in Jesus Christ. Sin will have no dominion over you. You might say, well, uh uh-oh, I'm I'm feeling a little fear here, Pastor, because I am a Christian. I do believe everything that you're saying today, and I'm genuinely saying amen, but I know that I fell short a few days ago. I did something a few days ago that I think would be considered sinful, and uh, for sin will have dominion, no dominion over you. That's talking about it has no power over you anymore. In 1 John chapter 1, verses 9, Chapter one, verse nine, it says, if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. So if a few days ago you sin, confess it. Confess it, and he will forgive you. The Bible tells us in that same chapter, he's speaking to Christians, all right, that if you are a Christian and you say you're without sin, you're a liar. That's what the scripture says. We all have moments, we all have bouts where we still get entangled in some of the yuck of this world And that's why Christ died for us. And all we simply need to do is take advantage and cash in on what he did for us if we mess up. How do we how do we do that? How do we cash in on it? We confess our sin. And the scripture says he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of your sin. Yeah, but you don't understand what I did. I don't. But he does. And he covered it. (laughs) He fully covered it. Someone say, praise God. So sin will no longer have dominion over you. It no longer rules over you, no longer owns you. It's no longer your master. It will not have lingering effects if you understand what Christ has done for you. Not in this life and especially in the next life. It will have no impact on you in the next life. And this is good news. This is incredible news. This is incredible truth. This is what the word of God teaches. And this is so powerful This is so powerful that when you really understand what the word of God is teaching us here this morning, it will change the way you think about how you're living and it will change how you're living, amen? See, we think, people think that just because we understand the power of God's grace over our sin, that people will sin no more. Paul addresses that. He says, well, then should we just, early on in Romans where Paul's trying to tell people about this grace, people kind of say, well, then what? Should I just keep on sinning? to show God's grace, and Paul says, no, God forbid. That's not the point. The point is this. When you understand the power of God's grace and it's at work within you, you might have a moment of battle with sin, but when you understand the power of what Christ has done for you, it will have no lingering effect over you, and you won't want to keep on sinning. You will run to the Lord, and what will you do? You will confess to him, Lord, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and he will say, I took care of it, and he'll reach down, and he'll pick you up, he'll dust you off, he'll give you a hug, and he said, now, come on, you and I are going to go at this together, and we got this, we got this, and that's the power of what Christ has done for you and I when we understand that. And the Lord's wanting us to understand that. Why? Because it will change how you look at the world. It will change how you look at the person who pulled the trigger. And it will also change the way you live your life. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14 says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forsaken us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands that he set aside, he nailed it to the cross. So that law, Jesus fulfilled. He also took that law and he nailed it to the cross. It no longer has any impact over our lives. Verse five says, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, 
that the person who does that the person who does the commandments shall live by them, all right? Now, the purpose of the law was to renovate our hearts, but the greater purpose of the law was to show men that they couldn't do it on their own. Now, Moses taught them here that if you were going to live by the law, then you had to live by all the law. It's not just one law. You couldn't just, out of all the laws that were there, you couldn't just perfect one law and think you had it made. If you're gonna live by the law, you had to live by all the law. Are you following me? And that's where we fell short because we might get really good at following, following one of the laws, but when it came to the other laws, we just didn't fare so well, all right? And you gotta understand something, that it's not just the 10 commandments that we're talking about here. It's not just the big 10. There were over 400 laws and precepts that you had to not only follow, but to follow them, you had to know them and understand them, remember them, and then you had to do them, all right? So if you religiously followed one law, is what Moses is saying here, then you had to live by all the laws, okay? Now I wanna go on because in the book of James chapter two, verse 10, it kinda takes an opposite view of that same thing. James said, if you have broken one part of the law, then you're guilty of breaking the entire law. We like to point out the sins in other people, don't we? We're really good at looking at how someone else fell and thinking, wow, that's horrible, that's too bad. That person struggled with that, that's, that's horrible. But then when we understand the power of Christ and what he did for us, and we come to the book of James and it says, if you have broken one part of the law, then you're guilty of having broken all the law. So that person may have done that sin and I would never do that sin. But if you've broken another part of the law, guess what category you're in? You're in that same category as them. So if you're gonna live by the law, you have to live by all the law. And if you think you're so great by being able to fulfill that law, listen, if you've, if you've broken any part of the law, you're guilty of it all. So maybe you've never murdered anyone, maybe you've never pulled the trigger, but if you've, if you've done anything else that would be considering falling short in the law, you're, just, you've, you're also guilty of pulling the trigger. Are you following me? Why, because it really has nothing to do with the actions. Just like the actions don't save us, the actions don't make us a worse sinner. The actions are only symptoms of our sin. Paul understood this revelation that God's decrees and his laws were intended to make them ready for the Messiah. That's really what we're coming up here, to show us that we're not good enough, we could never become good enough on our own, and it was to really get them yearning for a Messiah, for a Savior, an understanding that I can't do this, and I'm sucking wind here, because I'm trying, I'm working hard at following these 400 and some laws and precepts, and I just can't do it, and it was to prepare their hearts to finally come to a place of saying, God, I need your help. Preparing their hearts for a savior, for a Messiah. That's really where he was trying to get his people to that place. This is good news. This is incredible news. This is incredible truth. Verse six says, but the righteousness based on faith, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will ascend down into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word of God is near you, it's in your mouth, it's in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. It's a powerful faith, folks. Liberty, this is a blessing when we come to a place of understanding this message this morning. It's a real blessing and it will truly change how you look at the world and it will truly change, change how you live your life. Through faith in Jesus Christ, you are 100% sealed up, sanctified, and redeemed. That means that you're fully justified before God. You don't have to defend yourself anymore. Jesus defends you, amen? And you have been made fully righteous, not because of your goodness, but because of Christ's goodness. This is transforming information for those of us who will receive it. Unlike relying on the law to bring us into a relationship with God, if we're born again, it means that we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ to do for us that which we cannot do on our own. And it also tells us that that promise is always near us. It's in our mouth. All we need to say is, Jesus, it's in our mouth. He's right there. It's in our heart, and it's all around us. It's accessible to us all the time. Verse nine says, if you confess with your mouth, here we go, 
If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We pray it every week. It's my two favorite scriptures. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. It's the greatest news on the face of the planet. It's our only way of escape, too, by the way. Our only way of escape. Confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead and you will be saved. It's super simple. Say simple. It's super simple, yet it's super profound. I'm gonna ask the worship team to go ahead and make their way back up. Verse 11 says, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him would not be put to shame. I, I'm gonna skip a little bit here, but only sum it up by say this. Everyone say everyone. Everyone who believes. Everyone. Doesn't matter the color of your skin. Doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter. Whoever believes this will be saved. Yes, but that person is, or that person, everyone who believes will be saved and not put to shame. If you really believe and there's something wrong with you, and there's something wrong with all of us prior to salvation, but when you really believe and you receive the gift of God, he'll begin the changing work in us. That means we come to Christ as we are. We come to Christ as we are. We don't have to get good first to come to Christ. We come as we are, and once we have him, he goes to work on that. We become his renovation project, amen? It's a lot of work, but it's his work. Romans 10, 11 in the message version says, no one who trusts in God like this, heart and soul, will ever regret it. It's exactly the same no matter what person's religious background may be. The same God is for all of us, acting the same incredible, generous way to everyone who calls out for help. Everyone who calls help God gets help. That's pretty cool. Verse 12, there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of us all, bestowing his riches on all who call. I've already hinted on that. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are, where you came from. This applies to you. Romans 2.11 says, God does not show favoritism. This is good news for all of us. God is no respecter of person. It says also in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, all right? Verse 13 says, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a promise. I wanna close with this story this morning. I want you to say simple again. It's super simple, but super profound. A leading manufacturing company once developed a cake. It's still with us today. It's still in many of our stores, and it required only water be added, all right? It was a cake that all you had to do was take this mix and only add water. They ran tests. There, there were surveys that were given, uh, and the, the cake mix was found to be of superior quality. The people that tested this cake said, two thumbs up, this is good cake, man, all right? How many here like a good cake? Can I see your hand wave? I love cake, all right? Woo! It was good cake, and all you had to do was take the mix, and all you had to do was add a little bit of water to it. It tasted good, it was super easy to use, and it was moist. All right, what else do you want but a good moist cake? Just add water. Say simple. Just add water. The company spent large sums of money on advertising and marketing, trying to get the word out about this new cake mix. But over the course of time, it just wasn't taken off. It just wasn't cooking right. <laughs> People weren't buying it. They weren't, it wasn't moving off of the shelves. And the company spent a lot more money to try to figure out what the deal was. Why, why aren't people buying this? Just add water, cook it, and it's good, it's moist, it's, it's good cake. Why aren't they buying it? And from the results, they, they, they begin to go to work reformulating what the process was to make the cake. They took something out of the mix, and they said, we're gonna let you put this into the mix along with water. So now instead of just adding water, you had to also add one egg. <laughs> That's it, add one more ingredient. They took the egg out of the mix, and now you get this box, and you have to add water and an egg, and you have to stir it up. You have to blend it together before you cook it. The new cake mix 
required not only water, but also one egg. And guess what? It sold like hotcakes. Now, it's not pancakes, all right? But it sold like hotcakes. And for years now, it's been on shelves and it's become a leading product in its field. Well, what's your point, Pastor Tim? The point is this, why didn't the first mix, the first run, why didn't that take off like the second? It's because they found in their study, it was too simple for people. They, they, they thought to themselves, if, if all you have to do is add water, then it can't be true. It can't be true. So in their studies, they found, okay, we're gonna take the egg out of the mix and we're gonna have them, we're gonna add one further step. And just by complicating it just a little bit, people bought into it. Now it was legit, now it was real. Listen, I'm here to tell you today that, the, that, that, that if you want forgiven for your sins, you just need to confess Jesus Christ and believe him in your heart, that's it. If you want eternity into heaven, to spend heaven, uh, to spend all of your eternity with God and to experience all that he's preparing for us, all you need to do is receive Jesus Christ, believe upon him, confess him with your mouth, just receive him into your life. It's just that simple. Now, I thank the Lord that he has, that he can see into the future and he, he saw that people weren't gonna buy just the add water piece, all right? He saw that, so that in Romans chapter 10 and verse nine, it wasn't just believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, it was believe and confess. He gave us two steps instead of one step. So this morning, I'm gonna ask you to stand all over this place, and there's a couple things that are gonna happen right now before we leave, and I know we got one minute, so if you need to leave, you're welcome to leave but we're gonna stay just a few more minutes. Not a lot more minutes, just a few. But a couple things are gonna happen right now. Right now, if you're here and you do not know the love of Christ, you've not yet received this powerful understanding that, that Jesus died for your sin, you can never be good enough to earn it on your own. All you need to do is believe it and confess Jesus and he'll forgive you of your sin and make you into a new person. If you've never done that before, then today you have an opportunity to do that. You see, those people, and I'm not meaning to, this is just the truth. The people in these horrible scenarios over the last couple of days who were shot, the day before, they had no idea. They had no idea. We don't know what tomorrow holds for any of us. You might say to yourself, Pastor Tim, I wanna think about it. It is your choice, you have a free will. But I believe that the power of God has moved in such a way through this message today that in your heart, in your mind, you know that what you heard is true. I believe that with all my heart. I've been praying for that. Others of us here have been praying for that. So you don't know what tomorrow holds, but right now, God's offering you his mix for salvation. And it's to believe on his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to confess him as Lord and Savior. And if you will do that, you'll walk out of here knowing you're saved. And no matter what might happen to you tomorrow, you don't need to worry about it anymore, amen? So if you're here, if you're listening online, you say, Pastor Tim, that's me. My heart is not right with God, but I wanna be right with God. I need my sins forgiven, and I want to become a new person, and I want to learn more about this God who created me, and I want Jesus to help me to do that. I need him in my life. If that's you and you've never done that before, would you just raise your hand up right now and say, Pastor, I, I need Jesus. Is there anyone? Is there anyone, leave your hand up just a little bit so I can see, is there anyone that you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, but you know you need him? Is there anyone? I can't see you if you're online, so I'm gonna believe that, that 10,000 people just raised their hand online this morning. And we're gonna pray together for those 10,000 people, and as we pray, we're gonna rededicate our lives to the Lord. But here's the second thing I just learned, actually. That tells me that you and I in our desire that is being stirred up inside of us for the lost, it tells me that if there was no one here that needed the Lord and no one here that acted upon it this morning, it tells me that we as a church family have a little bit more praying to do, amen? So right now, we're gonna pray this prayer together this morning, and as we pray, we're gonna rededicate ourselves to the Lord. If you're listening online, you raised your hand, you're gonna receive by faith what you pray this morning, and as we pray, we're gonna say, Lord, 
Make me a vessel that you can use. I want to pray for the lost. I want to be available to minister to the lost. Lord, whatever you need, I'm available. That's our prayer this morning. Amen? So repeat after me. Dear Lord God, I'm a sinner. I fall short. But I believe and I confess that you sent Jesus as my Savior. He died on the cross in my place. He paid the price that I couldn't pay for my sin. And he was buried. And three days later, God raised Jesus from the dead. I believe this and I confess this in Jesus' name. And by grace, by faith, I receive my salvation according to the word of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap this morning? By the way, what, a, what an awesome crowd for our nine o'clock service this morning. Praise the Lord. Now I want to pray. And by the way, if you prayed that prayer online, there's a QR code that came up on your screen. Hold your phone in front of that. Some options will come up after you click on the link and uh, click uh, salvation. Take 30 seconds to fill it out. Uh, Pastor Bill, myself, or one of the other pastors would love to reach out to you, congratulate you, pray with you, and send you a gift, okay? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for my church family and what you're teaching us through your word. Lord, stir up that desire in us, Lord God, to be your vessels, to work through, and to use for the glory of your kingdom, that we might gain a heart for the lost like never before and that your spirit might work in us to pray for them and to intercede for them. And then, Lord, as you give us opportunity, that our hearts and our minds would be ready to share our faith, to tell our story, and to point them to you when you call upon us to do so. We believe, Father God, that you desire that none should perish, but all have everlasting life. And whatever part you may allow me to play in that, I want to play a part in that. In Jesus' name, and everyone said... Amen. Let's celebrate with this last song.